Hello, and welcome to Drawing from Observation. My name is Jose Garza. I am the museum educator at the Contemporary Museum St. Louis. Before we get started, I just wanted to bring your attention to a few functions in Zoom in case this was your first virtual program. So we are using the webinar mode, which means that I, we cannot hear or see you, but you should be able to see and hear me or us. <laughs> you will want to make sure that your volume is up on your device and you want to use the speaker view to make sure that the presenter screen is larger. So in order to access the speaker view, you can move your cursor and then you should uh, on your screen and then you should be able to see the speaker view button at the top right of your screen. You are viewing live, but you're going to see a combination of pre-recorded content and then I'm going to be guiding you through the program. If you are, and then also if you're seeing, if you're viewing us live, uh, thank you for joining us. But this program is going to be available on our website, so you can view it again if you enjoyed it or you want to share it with other folks. But if you are viewing live, I can field question by um, by the use of the chat uh, function. So if you have any questions, put them in the chat, and then at the once we conclude the presentation, I can uh, answer some of your questions. So yeah, feel free to uh, ask questions and uh, do that through the chat function. So drawing from observation has been adapted for virtual delivery of health and safety concerns due to COVID-19. Typically we would be meeting in the gallery, we would be looking at an exhibition and then we would be talking about, about a particular drawing format and technique and using it as a reference. But since we are meeting virtually, we're gonna take this as an opportunity to do things a little bit differently, maybe experiment a little bit if anything, we are going to take it as an opportunity to engage with our interest in drawing and then expand on its possibilities. So this program will feature an exhibition spotlight still. I'm going to introduce a drawing technique and then we'll have a special guest that will talk about the technique that I will be referencing and then how it relates to what they do. So this season's Drive from Observation will spotlight Great Rivers Banyo artist Tim Portlock and his current exhibition, Nickels from Heaven. And we'll use it in relationship to the drawing technique of perspective. And then we're going to also hear from a special guest, Chris Morosky from V3 Studios LC, who is going to share how he uses perspective in part of the design process. We're going to start with a virtual tour of Tim Porlock's exhibition, Nickels from Heaven. So if you haven't had a chance to see it, this is a, a nice way to kind of get an insight and get a layout for the exhibition. You can also visit us. We do have timed visits at the museum to keep folks safe. The museum also does accept walk-ins. I'm going to just introduce some of the concepts of the exhibition while the video is playing. So Tim Porlock's art focuses on the divergence between the idealism of the American of American exceptionalism and the lived realities of contemporary American cities with declining populations. He contrasts the blighted buildings of cities like St. Louis, Camden, New Jersey, and San Bernardino, California, with the idealism articulated through the conventions of 19th century landscape painting. So these images are based on constructions and demolition sites throughout these various cities. The artist focuses on recent changes to the skyline of cities that have undergone significant transformation in the past, specifically related to the housing market collapse of 2008. So through his imagery, Portlock explores ideas of failed modernist projects, industrial decline, white flight, displacement, and American optimism. In the works on view, Porlock focuses on the phenomena of entire neighborhoods disintegrating and new developments taking root with the blink of an eye. The artist blurs the distinction between what is being constructed and what is being replaced. Porlock is trained as a painter and muralist, but rather than using paint as a medium, he employs video gaming software in combination with drone aerial scanning to create his large scale cityscape prints. For the work on display, Porlock's 3D modeled buildings uses 3D model buildings that he came across in St. Louis, Chicago, Philadelphia, Los Angeles, Little Rock, and Camden, New Jersey. Each print is a constructed landscape containing buildings from multiple cities. So why do we want to use drawing to learn about artwork? So there's a couple of reasons. One, it is connected to the history 
of art. But one of the things that I love about drawing as a teaching tool is that it's portable, right? You can literally just carry the materials with you in your hand. Sometimes we have them with, with us at all times. It's immediate. A lot of times you can start drawing something and see, see results pretty quickly. And the other thing that I really like about it, it's that it's very accessible. So if you want to get started uh, drawing, all you need is a sheet of paper, a pencil, or a pen. And then why the emphasis on observation? So some, you know, for this, it might be a little bit obvious, but it's good to reiterate the reason why. But for artists, understanding the nature of the physical and natural world is fundamental to drawing, but also to art making. So if you understand how light reflects up to surfaces, if you understand, you know, how color can be affected by uh, distance, et cetera, it helps you kind of render things more accurately uh, through artwork, if that's, if that's the intent. Also, uh, drawing requires a close examination of the nuance of surface and the contours of form. So I like to think that when you look at something closely, you get to know it better and you understand it better. And I feel like drawing really gives us access to that. Third, I feel like that every time that I draw, I am engaged in observation. So I'm looking at something, I'm recording it, you know, so I'm drawing it, even if it's a doodle or if it's something more realistic that I'm spending a little bit more time on. And then maybe I am taking time to reflect and interpret what I'm doing. So we're going we're gonna to use some of that today. The technique that we're going to be talking about is perspective. So drawing is full of fundamental techniques that will improve how you create art. If you like or want to draw realistically, understanding these methods is extremely useful. So perspective is a tool that will help, under, help us understand how to render space accurately on a two-dimensional plane. And that's the other thing that's really incredible to me about uh, drawing is that you know, on a two-dimensional plane, on a, on a plain sheet of paper, we can imagine a landscape, maybe a cityscape, and by using some lines, we can render that accurately. So perspective drawing gives objects on a two-dimensional surface, like a sheet of paper, a sense of three-dimensionality, like it's coming off the paper. There are two types of personal. We're going to be talking about linear perspectives. There's an example on the image on the left, of course, and then atmospheric. In Tim Porlock's uh, work, he actually uses a combination of the two. We'll start with a couple of basics. So when we talk about one, two, or even three-point perspective, we're talking about linear perspective. And this is a method of representing space in which the scale of an object diminishes as the distance from the viewer increases. If it's further away, it starts to disappear. So essentially, objects that are further away from us appear smaller than those that are near. And then the position at which they meet at the horizon line or the intersection of where the ground meets the sky is called the vanishing point. In order for us to identify the different kinds of perspective that are maybe used in different works of art, the vanishing point is key to that and kind of locating where that's at. A good example of one point perspective is to imagine that you're looking down a railroad. All of the elements of the composition, particularly the track itself, would converge at a single point on the horizon line. In this illustration, it is towards the tunnel. The one point perspective can be at any point along the horizon line, right? So where the, where the sky meets the edge of the, the land and uh, not only the center. So the only requirement is that all lines lead to a single point. Although this may seem like a basic approach, it is evident in iconic works of art. And we're gonna look at an example. And just to reiterate, this particular example, the vanishing point is in the horizon or in the center, right? But it's like, in one point perspective, you can kind of move it up and down up, or side to side on that horizon. So the Adoration of the Magi from 1481 by the great Leonardo da Vinci is a, a great example of the use of one point perspective. So this incredible drawing demonstrates the great lengths that the artist went through to determine the focal point of the piece. And then I'm gonna show you the image in a second, but it's like, I want you to please notice how the lines from the steps and the arches all converge at the same spot on the horizon line. So as we look at this drawing, the really wonderful thing about this is that I love that it has a lot, a lot of reference lines in it. A lot of times, you know, especially when I'm teaching, um, drawing to younger audiences, uh, younger artists or art appreciators, you know, we're really obsessed with the eraser and, you know, making it look really great. But I love that a lot of times, you know, when we leave marks that show measuring or adjustment, it really kind of really informs the composition and, and like, leaves a really great insight into the process. So here, this is not a complete, complete artwork, I guess, <laughs> but we are using it as an example. And it's like a very beautiful one too, a very informative one where we can try to figure out where the, the convergent point is. So here, uh, maybe you already located it. And if, if you haven't, or you're still having trouble, I'm just gonna give us a little help locating it right there. This one is like a little off center 
on the composition. So just as one point perspective uses one vanishing point, two point perspective requires two, right? So these two points are usually at opposite sides of the composition. So such as one on the far left and then one on the far right. Instead of things going towards the center, uh, you have things kind of receding towards those two points or getting smaller as they go towards point one and two. Three-point perspective, it's also called multi-point perspective, has more than two vanishing points. So this is common, especially as the complexity of the subject matter grows. So a standard set of features, two vanishing points on the far left and far right of the composition, and then a third point uh, below or above them. So in doing this, you get a bird's eye view or what's called like an insect view. See if you can again, identify where maybe the horizon is, where the uh, point of a vanishing point is on the horizon. And then maybe we can identify the other points that are below or above the horizon. So I'm gonna give you a moment to just kind of look at this image uh, titled Beach View by Tim Portluck from 2015. We'll do a reveal. Some of you probably already found it or <laughs> you're still working on it. I can just, I can kind of show you. This dotted line is basically showing us where the horizon is. So a lot of times like the horizon is like very self-explanatory. We're very familiar with, with that term. For the first vanishing point, we're gonna look for it at the horizon. It seems like it's behind the billboard. You know, I think where I have the point there pretty accurate, you know, might, we could probably like nudge it over one way or the other. And then you probably notice that it, you know, the, the other points are not above the horizon. Like if the points were above the horizon, we'll be, we would be looking up at the composition, right? So almost like we're looking up at a building. So here, the clue that the other points are below the horizon line, of course, is that you kind of see the tops of the buildings, right? So you have a bird's eye view and you're looking down. So the uh, things are converging out, almost outward out of the frame at the bottom. If you can see it there at the far left, I put a, a point far uh, right, there's a point. These points are probably more accurately depicted if they were outside of the picture frame because they kind of keep continuing past that point, which gives you a really nice sense of scale, kind of where the, uh, the image is like gives the illusion that it's expanding beyond what we can see. But that's just like a good reference there. But again, the way that we can identify these points is by some of the markers, like looking at the tops of buildings or looking up at a building, let you know whether the uh, other points are below or above the horizon line. Linear perspective is based on mathematics. But atmospheric perspective relies on something different. This is also called aerial perspective, and it conveys depth through the va value changes, colors, and visual clarity. This image, also by Tim Potluck, helps illustrate atmospheric perspective. So the details, is, the details closest to us, usually at the bottom of the composition or the paper, are in sharper focus and are... The details closest to us on the bottom of the composition appear in sharper focus and are usually darker. And then as the scene recedes away toward the top, the landscape becomes brighter and softer. And another really great example of Tim Porlock using uh, atmosphere perspective is this work uh, titled Sunrise from 2011. On the on our CAM website, the Drawing from Observation event page, we put together some worksheets where you can practice one point and two point perspective. So these are PDFs, you can download them. It'll get you started. Hopefully easy to follow instructions, just a couple of steps showing you kind of how to get started and you can kind of build upon the instructions and make the compo composition your own. Materials for these two activities are uh, hopefully pretty easy to come by. There are paper, a pencil or pen, eraser and a ruler. If you don't have a ruler, sometimes if I misplace mine, sometimes I use another straight edge like a book or if I have a piece of cardboard, something straight and rigid really helps. And then there's a couple of tips there that you can kind of follow, kind of help you along. So there's, yeah, so we have a, a worksheet for one point perspective and two per point perspective. With those worksheets, you can experiment on your own. You could always, you know, come to the museum. Uh, you can look at Tim's work. Uh, you can also look at the building itself. Uh, one of the great things that I love about museums is typically they do allow you to draw in the museum. The reasoning for the for drawing from observation is that we can kind of talk about something and then do a little bit of drawing and or sketching in, in the galleries. Uh, one of the things that kind of really helps me to understand art a little bit better or where it helps it to resonate with me is where it intersects with my day-to-day -day life and uh, see where these things are put into practice by other people. 
and or outside of the museum walls. I think that's what really makes it exciting for me when I see something in the museum and then I experience it out in the real world. So I reached out to Chris Morosky, uh, who's an architectural designer of V3 Studios, and he's gonna give us a little bit of insight into how he uses perspective. So he's a designer, so it's art adjacent, of course, you know, so there's a lot of overlap there, but considering perspective, not only from a technical aspect, but also as a point of view, it's really interesting. So I'm gonna play a video of a pre-recorded video of a conversation with Chris. An architectural designer um, meets with clients and we spend a lot of time trying to understand their needs and their wants and then we translate those into a built environment um, and we try to meet and achieve each of those goals and um, we we do that through a various series of design tools um, you know drawing 3d modeling um, meetings with with the client and their their occupants um, yeah that that pretty much sums it up that's the short version <laughs> oh great no that sounds good I think that gives us like a little bit of context to kind of go off of and then yeah and then how do you use uh, perspective in your job so these are examples of floor plans and these are what we spend most of our time looking at as architects um, we realize that most of our clients, this doesn't mean much to them. And so we develop the project in elevation, which is an example here. Um, this is an example of elevation drawings. And you get a better sense of the space. So early on in the project, we, we start by sketching uh, floor plans multiple options to try to get a, a firm understanding of what the client's asking for and what the space requirements are. Um, we also develop projects in sections. So this is a section cut through a building. And when I was in school, this is really what they considered the most important method um, of design was designing in section because this was the method of, of representation that gave you a full understanding of the volume of the space. And the idea was to inhabit the space as a user and really try to get a feel and an understanding for what that space was like. Um, yeah, it looks like it's because the client would be seeing it from their perspective or their eye level, right? So you're starting design from the top to see the yeah. space as a whole? Yeah, exactly. And, and so in, in floor plan, you know, I think the reason um, designing in section is was so important is because that you don't, you never experience the space from a plan, right? And you never even actually experience uh, the space through an elevation. You experience a space through perspective. And so we, we um, explore designs and perspective. And the way we typically do that is um, early on in the project, just very quick, uh, just to get ideas out. We're not super concerned with accuracy or making the perfect drawing. And a lot of times it's a lot more cluttered than this. Um, and we just overlay sheets and we, we try out different options and we keep overlaying and trying out options and developing the design as we move on. Um, as, as I came into, as I left school and came into working for a firm, we were on the forefront of really adopting um, 3D 3D modeling software. And this is the same kind of software that the artist uses to create imaginary worlds and to explore these spaces that don't exist. And so this is a screenshot of one of our models. Um, and really this is just an extension of designing, uh, moving from designing in section to designing in perspective. And we try to get our projects into uh, a 3D form that we can explore through perspective views very early on. And it informs a lot of the design decisions that we make. Um, so I'll talk through a specific example here pretty quickly. Uh, so this is Webster University, a project that we did for them for their School of Communications. And this was early on in the design process. We had worked through the plan and we were beginning to think about how to articulate these spaces on the exterior of the building. And really all of that started from understanding that we wanted to make the entry to the building um, more prominent. 
And we did a series of sketches just over this image. Uh, you know, we probably did 10, 15 sketches. And then that led into a very early concept rendering that we shared with the client. From this point, we further defined what that would look like. And, you know, we sketched various options. We were thinking about all the different um, applications and the way we would build this. And then this is the ultimate design that we shared with the client based on, based on our understanding and what we learned through that process of developing the design and perspective. Uh, and then this is actually a section perspective. So there's a lot of great things you can show in a section that you can't see in a perspective and a lot of great things in a perspective that you can't see in a section. So this combines those two um, graphical representations to create a powerful image that explains some of the building systems and, and sort of the constructability of the project. And what we've learned through using this 3D software and, and thinking about designing in perspectives that design has become the most important graphical representational tool that we have. Um, it, it goes far beyond what you experience looking at a plan or an elevation and even a section and you truly get to sort of inhabit the space as the user. And a lot of times we change our design quite a bit once we get into the space and try to really understand what the light's going to look like and how tall it feels. Um, it's really the, the truest way to get a feel for the space. Uh, we also use perspective as an internal design tool. So these were renderings that I handed off to my interior designer and she you know, sketched over the top of them and, and marked them up to communicate different ideas to me. Now, this can all be done in elevation, but it's a lot more complicated and there's a lot more views involved um, to get the same amount of information. So it captures a lot, um, a, lot of, a lot more of the space in a more convenient way. Uh, we also use it to, for technical reasons, we use it to study, for example, lighting layout, um, custom furniture design. We'll quickly sketch out different ideas. You know, there's probably 30 sketches that went into this to get it to this point. Um, this was a, a really cool project that my coworker worked on and he had this idea for this kind of uh, crazy wall that had all of these TVs on it and it, it wrapped the ceiling. And um, we knew that it was gonna be difficult to communicate to the contractor um, just via elevation. So you can see here in elevation three, four and five, that's this wall, but it, it doesn't tell the full story. And so in order for us and the contractor and the clients all be on the same page, we started to develop these 3D perspective images of what this would look like um, with a lot of technical information built in. And eventually we, we built the whole wall um, as a 3D model and rendered it. And then we moved on to rendering that into the actual space. And so we shared this with the client um, to get their approval and to help us better develop the design. And then we actually embedded these images into the drawings to share with the contractors so that they had a, a better sense of what, what our intent was with the design. Wow, that's like amazing to see it from these different perspectives. And then when you see this kind of like mock-up or yeah, I don't know if that's the right word, that it, you really get a sense of like how big the space is. And yeah. I, I, yeah. when you show me this, like I can see myself in it, mm -hmm. which is like with the other, with the other uh, views. I can see kind of like how it's laid out, but I don't quite see myself in the space like I yeah. do with this, of course. Exactly, and, and we experienced that same thing. Um, this, is, this is kind of a tangent, but one thing we've, we've been developing since, since using these types of tools has been so successful, we started taking these images and doing uh, 360 degree perspective images and using um, VR goggles to give to the client and they can stand in the space and look around and see the full design. And that takes them to this next level of really inhabiting the space. And all of this is done before we've even started construction, you know, so they can get a true idea of, of what the design, what the final design will, will be like when it's realized. And wow, so this, you know, yeah, that's no, that sounds amazing. I, I think it's almost like how, uh, you know, uh, well, I think as a designer and artist work in a similar vein, where like you're kind of envisioning 
the possibility for something. So that kind of happens already. So being able to share that with somebody like through technology is kind of amazing. Yeah, it is. It is. And I think it's, it's changed. It's definitely changed the way we design and the way we think about design. Um, and I think it's become a critical tool for us to communicate that, that design, sometimes these more abstract ideas to a client um, and they can really, they can, it's, it's, it's an A to B kind of, or an A to A kind of thing. They, they see these renderings and they see the finished space and they just get it. Um, so it's, it's been incredibly helpful. Uh, so this is another project. This is an NPR. Um, so this was Learfield Sports, or this was Learfield, um, I forgot what they're called now. I think they're Learfield College Inc. or something like that. They keep changing their name, but um, this is a company in Dallas. And this is an NPR facility right outside of Seattle. And we were given an existing building um, and we had to put these broadcasting studios in the building. And broadcasting studios require a lot of um, very specific mechanical equipment and um, other kind of communication equipment that runs throughout the space. And in plan, we were trying to understand how all of these systems would overlay and affect our design. And you can see on the right side, all of these uh, red lines are, are sort of indicators of what those systems were. And so then we looked at them in section and, and we still weren't quite getting the the understanding of what all of this would, um, how this would, how all of this would impact our design, and so the the existing space had a had some historic architectural elements higher up that we wanted to highlight and keep, and so it became critical for us to understand how all of these complex systems interacted with this existing architecture. Uh, so we we did some quick study models in three D in perspective to look at how all of these um, mechanical requirements would, would sort of fit in and overlay and how we would work around them. And it informed what we were doing in terms of wall heights and pulling things down and where lights would go and um, how we coordinated with the mechanical engineers and communicated this to the client so that they understood what the space would look like. And then this developed into a rendering um, that showed all of that equipment and then this is the final space. And you can see sort of all that equipment tucked up in the ceiling there. And now all of these things that I'm mentioning, these are just one aspect of the design that we're, that we're focusing on here, but we do this with a thousand different aspects of the design. So we, we look at how this broadcasting studio is gonna feel in perspective and we make changes to heights of windows and um, things like that. So, we use it on every every des design decision and aspect of the project, uh, but I'm, I'm just giving you some examples of the different ways we're using it here. I also see it in like it's also present in the photography. Right? Yeah. So how you see like there's like the the, the central point and how things kind of re uh, uh, recess or go you know go out of perspective to like uh, smaller points in the ends or. It gives you like a, a, this gives me like a sense of where I'm, I feel like I'm actually standing in the space. Yeah, and we're, we're really conscious of that when we decide which renderings to share with the client um, and how, how we represent that depth of the space. And so you can see this, this image and the photograph were taken from exactly, almost exactly the same point. And, and you get that, that same sense of uh, this, this kind of stretching middle center and the and these uh, elements that are running along the ceiling, highlighting that that horizontality. Um, this is a, a kind of a fun project that we did. This is a part of a project that we did for the Cardinals, and it is their family room. It's where the players' kids go during the games. Um, so it accommodates kids from you know three to twelve. And they hang out here with their families and watch the game and, and play. And um, there's educators here that are with them. And when we first started this project, we were really looking at it as, a, as in kind of a standard way. And we were designing as we normally would in perspective, um, taking these images and these renderings. And at one point it occurred to us that we were setting all the eye heights uh, sort of all the perspective eye lines 
at about 510, um, which is about, you know, where we set most of our designs. And we realized that that's not going to be the primary user of the space is that it's actually, a, you know, we have to drop that, that eye line to a, to a, a child's height and, and see what they see in the space. And it allowed us to um, make a lot of changes to this, thinking about heights of various, various elements in here in storage pieces and lowering wall graphics on the wall um, to engage the kids and pull them into certain areas and isolate other areas. And that that's only possible when you are able to think about how someone else is perceiving um, a design from their point of view. We've also we've also done this on we, so we do um, recording studios and we do a lot of performance venues. And so we've thought about this when, for example, how a wheelchair user is going to um, move throughout the space and what they're seeing and what they're experiencing and, and how that affects our design decisions. And so we're able to accommodate um, that or consider all of that by using these, these, this perspective as a tool. Um, so, you know, kind of going back to our original floor plan, um, if you just look at a floor plan, you may not fully understand what all these spaces are unless you look at them every day. But as soon as you add the element of perspective, you start to get a much better sense of, of what these feel like um, and what they contain. And the next step is to move into the space and really view it as, as you would be if you were there. Um, and then the, the ability to go from an image like this to a final project that looks like this uh, has been invaluable for us and for our clients. And I think that's, that's all the images that I had put together. I have lots of other images, but that was kind of the overview version. No, that was actually, I, I thought that was really great. Uh, and um, I like how you kind of walked us through all that. When you were talking about the children's space, it reminded me, you said, um, you know, being able to see how they see, you know, so in relationship to like not only the space, but of course their height, but it, it really um, resonated with me with regards to Tim's work, you know, where, you know, there's like the aspect of like the technical, it's like, how do you render like a building uh, digitally, whether it's like a pre-existing building or one right. that he's constructing for the composition, but also like how, you know, how do other people see like decay, maybe juxtaposed with like something new kind of coming up or how do certain people that live in certain spaces even inhabit those spaces or maybe think about how they, they would inhabit uh, something in the future, you know? And so it made me think about like, not only thinking about how I'm looking at the images, but also like where these, these images are being kind of constructed and um, how that experience would be too. And I think like the size of the images, like the perspective of how I'm looking at them, but also thinking about them, not just in how they're facing me, but like now I feel like I'm thinking about them more in the round you know, from right. what you were describing. Cause I think that's what you have to do, right? Of course, it's like, you're looking like you start from the top and then like, you're kind of like changing how you yeah. enter the space yeah. to, uh, to articulate it, but to under not only understand it for yourself but you're understanding it for your client but also for the people that are gonna be like using the space. So there's like, I feel like there's like a lot of levels of like trying to understand <laughs> the space not just like from your perspective as a designer. Like I feel like you have to kind of consider all these different uh, ways in which it's experienced. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, a lot of a lot of these images, they they help us design, but they're also telling a story. You know, and we're we're careful about what we what we include and don't include, and in the views that we show, because we want to uh, we want to express a certain story through through our images and and a certain um, feeling, right? So if we moved over for this image, for example, if we moved over to the right side and we were suddenly in the, in the sort of loungy area, it would feel very different. And we, as designers, it's, this is our best tool to try to really understand how it's gonna feel. We, 
we, you know, we don't have some magical ability to do that that other people um, don't. We're only able to do it through these tools and um, these being able to 3D model the space. And I think maybe two years ago, we had started experiments with the VR glasses. And even that, when we go into a certain space and put on the VR glasses and look around, I immediately changed aspects of that design through that experience. Um, you're able to, to really in, inhabit the space. And that's, as designers, that's, our, that's sort of our like primary goal. It's to really understand what somebody walking through the space is gonna, is gonna feel, how, it's gonna, how they're gonna experience it as they move through. And, and really this is, it's, it's the critical way of, that we do that. And, and Tim's work is, is exactly the same. I mean, he uses, he uses almost all the same tools that we do. He maps and models um, all of these elements in 3D, and he picks a view that's going to tell the story that he wants to tell, um, that that we resonate with, you know. And we're we're trying to do a similar thing. So it's great to look at his work and see the, this kind of technology being used in that way. Um, we're trying to do it that that sort of furthers the client's goals, but he's. He's using it to his, his, express his own opinion and tell his own story. And I think it's, yeah, I think it's awesome. Thanks for your time. This was really great. Thanks for all the insight. Really appreciate it. Cool. Thank you for joining us. I'm going to share our last, uh, that was our last part of the conversation with Chris. Uh, very generous of him to share some of his expertise with us. Uh, and um, to let us know how perspective relates to his practice, not only from a technical level where um, when it comes to the designs, but also understanding uh, the client, but also the folks that are gonna inhabit the space. So let me sh uh, show you the last part of our, um, where is it? One moment. Thank you, for, thank you for bearing with me. Let me see if I can find it again. I almost lost, lost my place. Yeah, thank you for joining us for Drawing from Observation. Just wanted to remind you that the museum does have COVID. We, have, uh, we do have steps in place to keep you safe during your visit. We have time visits, so you can go to the museum website to schedule a visit. Also, some of the images that I use, I found in Tim Porlock's website. So also a lot of other great work, a lot of really awesome work that we have here at part of the Great Rivers Banyol and his exhibition, Nichols from Heaven. But you can also visit uh, Tim Porlock at his website listed here. And then one of the tools that I use as an avid uh, fan of drawing or practitioner of drawing is that there's a, an organization called the Circle Line Art School. Maybe some of you are familiar with it. And they have really great tutorials online. It's always great to get together with people and draw, but during these times where that's not uh, quite such a good idea, uh, you can always find other folks making. Uh, Circle Line Art School has some great tutorials on two, three point perspective. I highly recommend them. For our upcoming exhibition, we will have another Drawing from Observation program. I can't guarantee that it's not going to be virtual, but thank you for joining us for this experiment. Stay safe and hopefully we see you for our next program. Thank you for joining us again.